thank you for joining us today at the Holland on the Hill uh, webinar on sustainable finance. Uh, before the pandemic, we used to organize uh, these events uh, in person, physically on Capitol uh, Hill, bringing together uh, experts, staffers, uh, members of the diplomatic community, private sector stakeholders to discuss issues, policy issues that are relevant both for the, uh, the United States and the Netherlands. But now, given the circumstances, we have to do it digitally. Um, this seminar is part of the Holland on the Hill uh, program, which is a joint effort of the US uh, Congressional Caucus in uh, the Kingdom of the Netherlands, uh, the Royal Netherlands Embassy, corporate partners, and the Netherlands America Foundation. And the idea is to strengthen uh, the economic, the political, the cultural ties of our nations. I'm very uh, pleased to see that uh, Representative Bill Huizinga, who is the co-chair of the Dutch caucus in the House of Representatives, uh, uh, is joining us. Bill, welcome. Good to see you again. And uh, also a representative, uh, Emmanuel Cleaver, a member of the Dutch caucus, will join us or has joined us already. So I'm looking forward very much to uh, Mr. Huizinga's uh, remarks. Uh, today, as I mentioned earlier, the subject is uh, sustainable finance. Um, and the question is, what, what, what role can the financial sector play to, to, to help to address the challenges that stem from, from the climate crisis? So actually, the, the, the question is, in the climate discussion, how do we go back from 51 billion to zero, as you all know? That requires many, many plans uh, and many actions in various fields. If you've read the book of, um, of uh, Bill Gates, you know that it has to deal with how we make things, how we plug in, uh, how we grow things, how we move along. Uh, and I'm, I'm happy with the amb ambitions that are present on both uh, sides of the Atlantic, both in the United States and in uh, Europe and the Netherlands. We have high, high, high level ambitions. That's good. Uh, because it's important that in order to fulfill, the, fulfill these ambitions, we have to uh, work together. Uh, and we means uh, the, te the technological side, the markets and the policy all at the same time. Uh, and that requires, of course, sustainable financing. Um, well, sustainable financing, I'm sure it will be discussed later, offers possibilities, but also risks. Um, a recent report in the Netherlands uh, from uh, Beerschot and uh, Kalafasia showed that um, the risks are currently seen as high by uh, investors, uh, also because of the uncertainty of the plans that will uh, be further developed. And if one thing, uh, if one thing is certain, uh, investors do not like uncertainty. So it's important that government policy makes clear objectives, clear policy, and then it's important that uh, financiers will step in. Um, we, the Dutch government, do our best to play our role as well. Um, we uh, were the first to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, to bring to the market the green bond in 2019 with a AAA rating, uh, which is uh, one element in our approach, but of course uh, more needs to be done. And what can be done is something that we discussed today when it comes to uh, 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 sustainable finance. Uh, we will talk about the lessons that uh, each country has learned, and the best practices, also uh, things that are not working. Uh, so in short, the objective of this uh, uh, meeting is what can the US and the Netherlands learn from each other uh, when it comes to sustainable finance? And very important, where can we further uh, intensify our cooperation? So I would like to thank our Holland on the Hill uh, corporate partners who make these uh, events possible. Uh, specifically ING, uh, but also the, the people who are leading uh, and participating in the panel discussions. Thank you very much. Now, let me turn the floor over to uh, Representative Huizinga. As I mentioned earlier, he's the co-chair of the Dutch caucus, and he's a member of the uh, Financial Service Committee. And after uh, uh, Representative Huizinga has spoken, our moderator, a Dutch climate envoy, Marshall Beukeboom, will then take the floor and introduce the panel. Thank you very much, and I'm looking forward to a great meeting. Bill, the floor is yours. Thank you, Your Excellency. And uh, Andre, you have been uh, uh, here at a challenging time for all of us, obviously, and uh, have done a great job. And I'm excited that we can, uh, can reconstitute these Holland on the Hill events like this. Uh, looking forward to trying to do some in person. I'm, I'm wearing my Holland on the Hill button this morning. And uh, just as a reminder to my colleagues as well about uh, the 
uh, the importance of this uh, this program. So uh, congratulations on that. And it is uh, that is the goal of us all to make sure that we are uh, fostering dialogue, making sure that we are having uh, a, uh, a a frank conversation. And uh, being uh, being of Dutch background myself, sometimes it's a blunt conversation, which is a good thing. Uh, but uh, we have a, a lot of a lot of things on our plate right now. Um, economically, certainly, as we are seeing uh, some signs of inflation uh, and what may be happening there. Yet at the same time, the Federal Reserve is uh, is keeping its foot on the gas, so to speak, uh, with the economy trying to keep liquidity up. Uh, and uh, there is uh, there's a there's issues within all of our economies, uh, sort of where we are coming out of yet this uh, this pandemic pandemic. Uh, so this is an important issue to to be discussing. And uh, I will uh, let me maybe uh, start uh, first by noting that uh, we uh, we're having a challenge in, internally within our uh, within our committee and within our structure here of defining terms. Uh, oftentimes, that, uh, that is one of the challenges that so many people have is agreeing on what words and terms actually mean. And what is the goal and objective uh, may be more, uh, more unified than, uh, than what we suspect, but we have those challenges of trying to figure out uh, the same language. So uh, we're, uh, we're working through that. Uh, obviously, here in Washington, uh, if you're paying any attention to any of the news, uh, we've had a lot of discussions about the ESG, uh, environment, uh, the social and the government governance uh, issues. And a lot of the debate uh, is what is the role of the Securities and Exchange Commission? Uh, what is the roles of bank regulators? Uh, what uh, is the, uh, the goal and the objective uh, of the private sector? And what's the goal and objective of the regulators. Uh, I will uh, freely admit my bias is towards the private sector uh, saying this is our goal and objective because as, uh, uh, as uh, um, Investor Hespel said, said uh, I, I wrote it down, uh, investors do not like uncertainty. That's exactly right. And, uh, and, and I think the more that we can have the private sector in there uh, figuring out the parameters of this, uh, looking at uh, what, uh, what is relevant in one industry uh, may not be as relevant or may not even be achievable in another industry. Uh, you know, certainly it's a lot easier to green finance, uh, may not be as easy to green manufacturing uh, or, or energy production. Uh, that, uh, you know, again, that's sort of uh, the, the challenges that, uh, that we are having and, and certainly um, there has been a rush towards, uh, uh, towards these ESG funds uh, and, uh, and, and people wanting to get these things on their books, uh, wanting to get them in their policies, wanting to get them in their goals and objectives. Um, I, uh, I, I, won't, uh, I won't mention names, but recently I've been meeting with the heads of uh, some multinational uh, uh, finance uh, organizations, one of them yesterday. And uh, what, I, what I said to this person is, here's what I can't stand is window dressing. Uh, I don't meaning, I don't like just having something there to have something there and to feel good about it. Uh, if, uh, if there's a goal and objective, I wanna make sure that we're actually hitting upon that. And uh, that, is, uh, that is important to me. And, and you know, uh, interestingly enough, things like the, there was recently a Wall Street Journal article about uh, ESG funds and what their fee structure is. And uh, one of those funds, for example, it almost identically mirrors the S&P 500, uh, yet charges a, a, a multiple uh, on what, uh, what anyone who is uh, dealing with an S&P uh, fund is actually charging for management. Um, it's those kinds of things that that the private sector is going to have to work through. We're going to have to work with the uh, with the regulators. Uh, and again, I guess my bias is to make sure that uh, that uh, the 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 force, the blunt force of government and of regulators, is used uh, very sparingly uh, versus uh, versus having. Uh, the private sector to uh, to set that up. So uh, that's uh, that's at least a, a view from my side. Uh, and uh, I know that you're going to be having my friend uh, uh, Congressman Cleaver 
on later today, uh, which is a good thing. He's a, he's a very good man who uh, we serve uh, well together on the Financial Services Committee and uh, have a great relationship, uh, but you may get a little slightly different perspective, so, uh, which, is, uh, which is great. But uh, so with that, uh, I'll turn it back with one last uh, note again of just saying thank you uh, for, uh, for joining us. Thank you for being a part of the Holland on the Hill program. Uh, and for the embassy and the uh, and the private sector uh, sponsors of this, uh, this has been very valuable. I have people coming up to me uh, constantly, all the time, and and with and staff here's the same thing. And being a former staff person, I know that it is often the staff that run uh, run the things uh, that uh, that that are going on, and uh, making sure that staff and senior staff and members are. Uh, informed about this very special relationship is important. And uh, this is a great program with that. So uh, with that, I'll turn it back over. Thank you, uh, Representative. Uh, it's uh, good to see you, to see you again, I have to say. Um, I was posted in, uh, in the United States in Washington, D.C. over 10 years ago. And uh, I was a member, a board member of the Netherlands America Foundation as well. And as such, we have met during several of these Holland on the Hill uh, meetings. So it's, it's good that it still exists. And it's good to see that you're still co-chairing it. And uh, thank you for kicking off this, uh, this webinar. Um, I think you raised several important issues already. Um, we have about an hour with an expert panel to, uh, to go over them, uh, perhaps in a little bit more depth uh, as well. Um, I am now the climate envoy for the Netherlands. Um, and as such, I try to connect the dots between international agreements like the Paris Climate Accord and national climate action. And today I try to connect the dots between Europe and the US and climate change and the financial sector. And as Ambassador Haspel said, we will talk about sustainable finance today. And from, from my perspective, it is great to see that climate action is a key priority for the United States again. And the appointment of my colleague, climate envoy John Kerry, is a great signal to the international community. And his appearance at the Climate Adaptation Summit that was hosted by the Netherlands earlier this year, right after the administration took office, was a good illustration of the, the broad interpretation of the task at hand. Last month, uh, the Biden administration organized its own climate summit. And at this uh, so-called leader summit on climate on the 22nd of April, John Kerry said, given the magnitude of this challenge, governments alone cannot possibly find all the necessary investment. There's no government in the world that has enough in their budgets to be able to provide what we need to make this transition. Ultimately, how governments international financial institutions and private providers of capital work together is really going to determine the outcome of this challenge. That is, I think, a perfect kickoff for the, uh, the panel that we will, uh, the panel discussion that we will have now. I will introduce the speakers one by one, also uh, by asking them uh, a question. And my first uh, panelist is going to be Olaf Slijpen. Olaf is a governing board member of the Dutch Central Bank, the DNB. And uh, Mr. Slijpen, uh, my first question to you would be, and it, perhaps it's a little bit of a variation of what Representative Huizinga also spoke about earlier. He spoke about language and definitions. We always talk about sustainable finance. And, and my question to you would be, would there be any other type of finance? What do we actually mean by, by sustainable finance? Um, well, uh, thank you for organizing this, uh, this great uh, webinar on a very great uh, subject. It was really great to listen uh, um, to both Representative Fausinka as well as the Ambassador. Um, and indeed, it's not a secret that, uh, let's say, um, the Netherlands is among one of the countries that uh, feels that climate change is a challenge, also a challenge for our economies, but also actually provides a lot of opportunities and we are to see that the uh, US administration uh, is also uh, is also uh, let's say subscribing to this uh, to this view because indeed let's not forget it's it's a risk but it's also 
a, a, clearly a challenge for uh, uh, for uh, and provides a lot of business opportunities. Um, let me also say that I totally agree with Representative Huizinga when he says that there's a very large and, and, and maybe even largest role to play here for markets and in particular also for financial markets. There's a, there's, a, there's a large supply of capital coming from banks, coming from institutional investors, um, and there is quite some demand uh, when it comes to projects that are aimed at basically greening the economy um, and all kinds of projects that are, uh, that are uh, let's say, or the, 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 the terms to make possible the transition or to a low carbon emission economy. The problem, however, is that at this point in time, demand and supply do not really match. Where the government comes in or regulators come in, um, because yes, I also very much believe in the power of markets, but we also know that markets are not always perfect. And the problem when it comes to sustainability or climate change is that the price of, let's say, CO2 emissions uh, is not internalized in, uh, in, our, uh, uh, in, in our economy, in our, in our financial system. Uh, we're trying to do that, at least in the Euro European Union, we're trying to do that. Uh, and the only way, actually, the let's say the best way, the most effective way, every economist can tell you that, to do that is indeed to, let's say, uh, start uh, leaving CO2 emission. Um, because if that would happen, it would definitely, let's say, improve the business case for banks, insurance companies, um, uh, uh, pension funds, and what do you have, let's say, for investing in uh, more sustainable projects? Uh, the business case now is not good enough yet, and this has to do with the fact that yeah, CO2, CO2 prices are, are not reflecting, let's say, the, the damage they do to, uh, to uh, let's say, the world we live in. I think that's one of the key issues. There, there are many, many more. Uh, we can talk about that later, uh, but I think this is uh, indeed an important one. Also a very sensitive one, politically extremely sensitive. I totally realize that. And like any transition process, if you move an economy from, let's say an economy which is highly, let's say carbon-based to one which is uh, low carbon-based, um, it's a process which creates uh, a lot of opportunities for businesses, but also pain. And that's something we also have to acknowledge. So also an important role, I think, of the government is to help companies um, to, let's say, go through that transition. And there are actually quite a lot of good examples uh, in many, many countries all over the world um, of countries that, or of companies that already made that transition over the time. And you can also say, yeah, it's part of a normal market process. That's how a market functions. You know, uh, the world changes um, and also companies have to adapt to, to, to it. I'll leave it, I'll leave it, uh, I'll leave it, uh, for now, I'll leave it here, Marcel, thank you. Okay, thanks for this, this very clear introduction. Maybe one, one follow-up question. Um, you, you talk about the pain that th this transition might cause to some companies. Um, I think the National Bank, as a, as a supervisor, also warned for the pain that climate change would cause uh, when we won't act. Can you say a little bit more about where you have come from uh, since the past several years and, and, and how, let's say, the markets are reacting to yes. that, that stronger signal that you're sending? I mean, um, the, the, the central banking community has started to think about climate risk maybe five years ago, some, um, and it all started, I think, with uh, Mark Carney's uh, famous speech, The Tragedy of the Horizons. Uh, Mark Carney at that point was the governor of the Bank of England. Um, and then gradually, I think, uh, this took off uh, with a number of central banks, uh, including the Dutch Central Bank, but uh, indeed the Bank of England um, was involved as well by setting up a network which uh, is called Network for Greening the Financial System, um, 
what's in the name i mean uh, we i talked to some 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 of my uh, american colleagues over time also about the network and what the network is doing and i always had to explain a little bit what what is behind that name which uh, which uh, sounds maybe a little bit activist and we are activists but maybe in a different way than the the name suggests anyway that network has grown over time now to uh, to a very large a group of central banks worldwide uh, we are more than 18, 18 we have more than 80 members a, a large group of, of observers and also uh, recently the federal reserve has actually joined the ngfs and we what we do is share experiences uh, share knowledge about what central banks can do let's say to smooth that transition so to speak um, and one of the things we do, indeed, as a regulator, and the Netherlands is a central bank, is also the, the financial regulator of the financial sector. It's not the same in every country in the world. Is that we really ask uh, banks, but also insurance companies, pension funds, um, to take account uh, in their risk management practices, risk management frameworks, um, the 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 risks actually emanating from climate change and they're basically two you can say we have there's something that we call physical risks uh, which which is uh, assume you are an insurance company assume you are selling insurance policies uh let's say to uh, um uh which uh, uh have to be paid out or uh, when there's a period of uh, of uh, uh, when there are relatively dry periods, something like that. And actually, we do have that in the Netherlands. Of course, if, if the climate is going to change, if you will see, let's say, more, more long periods of, of, let's say, hot summers, dry summers, but at the same time, also maybe much more humidity, uh, it's going to have an impact on, let's say, the risk profile of these policies. It's something you have to take into account. Then we also have the transition risks. And the transition risks, indeed, they have to do with the fact that the economy will go through that transition and that a company which is regarded as, you know, triple uh, uh, A um, might actually not be in the future because the company heavily relies on fossil fuel. And I mean, even today, you know, when you read the newspapers, at least in the Netherlands, uh, but you can actually mention any other oil company, how will those companies look like in 10, 15 years from now? Some of them are very are working very hard on transition, but others are not. Uh, and if you are a bank, the bank providing credit to these kind of companies or shareholder, uh, you might actually run uh, run. You, you're actually being being confronted with with a risk, and those are the, the what we call the transition risks. Now we have started actually challenging financial institutions. Do you know what your risks are in this respect? And how do you manage them? Um, this is one of the many things uh, uh, that we do. Um, and we see that now also um, coming back actually in, in legislation in the European Union, but also in international standards on banking supervision. Uh, there is actually the Basel Committee, the, the, the global committee working on the, on the global banking regulation standards is looking at this. There's a, there's a, a, a a task force which is uh, co-chaired by my former colleague Frank Alderson, who is now on the board of the uh, European Central Bank uh, and uh, a member of the uh, of the uh, also the board of the Federal Reserve, um, who are looking at this together to see whether we can come up with, let's say, some kind of global standards that might event that might eventually have an impact on banking regulation. Thank you, and, and uh, I'll definitely get back to that later. But let me first go uh, via the other panelists and also encourage uh, the viewers of this uh, webinar to uh, participate by using the, uh, the question and answering uh, uh, facilities that are there. I see that several questions are coming in already. I'll keep an eye on the, on the chat to include them in the discussions that we are having. Um, Representative Huizinga, uh, thank you for also being here. Feel free to interact if you uh, if you like. Um, but I first go to the the next panelist, and that is uh, Robert Litterman. Uh, Robert is the chairman of the Climate Related Market Risk Subcommittee of the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, the CFTC. 
Um, Mr. Litterman, welcome also uh, on, the, on this panel. Um, you chaired the committee that, that published the first report of a US financial regulator on climate risk for the financial sector. Can you briefly describe the role of the CFTC and, and the main recommendations from your report? And of course, any other reaction that you might have at this stage already to, uh, to what you have heard already? Yeah, well, thank you, Marcel, for organizing this and inviting me to participate. Uh, the central message of the CFTC's uh, Managing Climate Risk in the U.S. Financial uh, System report is that U.S. financial regulators must recognize that climate change poses serious risks to the U.S. financial system, and they should move quickly and decisively to measure, understand, and address these risks, as well as to help increase the flow of capital toward building the net zero economy of the future. The key recommendations of our report include the following. U.S. regulators already have wide-ranging and flexible authorities to start addressing climate-related risks. They and market participants are at an early stage in understanding and should be experimenting with how best to monitor, manage, and disclose climate-related risks. Insufficient data and analytical tools, including common transition scenarios and agreed upon decision useful measures of exposure to climate related financial risks remain a critical constraint. The lack of common definitions and meaningful standards for climate related data and financial products is hindering the ability of market participants and regulators to manage climate risk. Also international engagement by the US could be significantly more robust and finally, financial markets will be able to channel resources efficiently and at the scale needed to activities that reduce greenhouse gas emissions if and only if an economy-wide price on carbon is in place that reflects the true social cost of such emissions. The fact that the subcommittee members unanimously endorsed the report indicated clearly that this is not a controversial or partisan issue. We all agree that the fundamental nature of the problem and the path forward. The committee was asked to write a high-level report, but to include many specific recommendations. It was not an easy task, and there was a period when it was not clear that we would get to consensus, but we continued to try and push on to find wording we could all agree upon, and in the end, we succeeded. Since then, the report has been widely read and well-recognized and well-received. For example, uh, Mary Shapiro, former chair of the SEC, on February 2nd in a Brookings webinar called the report a superb roadmap for financial regulators to manage climate risk in the financial system. Many of our recommendations are now being considered and some have already been implemented. As you noted, for example, the Federal Reserve recently joined the NGFS. The Treasury Department has established a climate risk hub with multiple work streams focused on climate risk. And the CFTC itself has set up a climate risk unit. Business organizations are also evolving in their statements of support about climate change. The Business Roundtable, the Chamber of Commerce, the National Association of Manufacturers, and even the American Petroleum Institute are now all supporting or moving towards support for market approaches to reducing emissions. Hundreds of companies, municipalities, universities, states, and countries are now making pledges to reach net zero by 2050. And many investors and asset owners are pledging to align their portfolios with a rapid transition to net zero. And the new administration has clearly made climate risk an all of government focus. As a risk management professional focused on climate change, I've been working for the past decade to highlight the need to create strong, globally harmonized incentives to reduce emissions. European countries have already created such strong incentives to reduce emissions, and their economies are much less carbon intensive today. China is in the process of implementing a nationwide carbon pricing system, and it is long past time for the United States to move forward. I suspect we all understand how incredibly efficient the financial markets are in driving capital toward opportunities to make profits given the incentives that investors face. Today, unfortunately, those incentives continue to direct capital in what we all agree is the wrong direction, toward the existing fossil fuel driven high carbon economy. When those incentives change, there will be a rapid phase change in the flow of economic capital toward the net zero economy of the future. The longer we delay in implementing carbon pricing, however, the more pollution will enter the atmosphere, the higher will be the ultimate average temperature change, the longer will be the pulse of heat, and the greater will be the risk of crossing a tipping point, 
leading to the type of nonlinear response that can create irreversible damage to the global ecosystems and human well being. Let me conclude by summarizing our message succinctly. We need to slam on the brakes. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that's, that's a very clear summary. Um, when I listened to you right after we listened to Mr. Schleipen, it, it almost seems that there's great alignment between the, uh, the, the U.S. and the European financial sector. And so I, the same, I, you, you talk about that, that we are still moving in the, in the wrong direction. And I think that that's the, the report that was published by the International Energy Agency uh, today um, kind of illustrates that indeed we are still on, on a very narrow path, as they describe it, towards um, the realization of the, the Paris objectives. Is it indeed that we all know what the problem is and that the financial sector is, is having everything in place to do the right thing and that we are waiting for, for politics, or is that too simple? No, that's exactly right. <laughs> Everyone knows what we need to do. Uh, it's a bug in the tax code. We've, we've identified it. We know how to fix it. And we're waiting for the politicians to figure out how to move forward. I think it's going to happen soon. I'm actually quite optimistic. And uh, well, hopefully, hopefully we will move forward on a bipartisan basis because that way businesses will understand that it's a permanent change and they'll, you know, move forward much more quickly. Uh, so. Uh, I, I think we're there. And frankly, from a global perspective, I think most countries have already, you know, recognized it, are ready to move forward and are waiting for the U.S. So I think when the U.S. moves, it will be, uh, you know, the, the final straw and uh, the world will move forward. We have reached a, a very firm conclusion in the first 15 minutes of this webinar already. So <laughs> thank you for that. Um, uh, and it's we are having this virtual meeting on the hill, so hopefully the uh, the message is, is well understood by uh, by our viewers. Let me use this as a, a little segue to uh, introduce the next speaker. Um, that is Julia Christiansen of the World Resources Institute. Uh, Julia is the acting global director, uh, Sustainable Finance Center at WRI. Um, Julia, you have heard the uh, the two. Uh, speaker, the two first speakers on this panel, uh, giving it a, a financial sector perspective. Um, and, and our preliminary conclusion was, yes, we know what the problem is. Uh, maybe turn to you as a, as a researcher as well. Um, is, there a, is it so simple? Is there a one size fits all solution for all countries for sustainable finance? Or, or is there a more to say. I'm sure there's more to say about it, uh, knowing the, the WRI. So maybe you can uh, shed some light on that. Thank you, Marcel. And thank you um, to you and the organizers for having me here today for this discussion. I'm delighted to be part of the conversation. Um, to, to answer your question, I think um, on the one hand, yes, I completely agree with Bob. Yes, in many ways, we know what to do. Um, but, you know, the, the challenge of aligning finance with sustainability goals is, is rather complex and there is no single um, one size fits all solution across the, across the globe. Um, and this is especially true when we consider different types of economies and how their needs may differ for various reasons. So um, we would want to take into consideration, you know, what stage of development is a country at? Is it a major emitter? Um, is it a major fossil fuel producer, exporter? Order, um, how vulnerable is it to the impacts of climate change? And then how much is the private sector already taking climate change into um, and, and broader sustainability goals into account? Um, the other consideration, obviously, you know, we're, we're all here virtually because of the pandemic um, and the, the social and economic impacts of the pandemic are still unfolding. Um, and that does put many countries' fiscal accounts under stress and leaves them with a little less room to finance some of the upfront incremental costs um, of, of transitioning to a more sustainable economy. So that makes the private sector all the more important. Um, and I think that resonates with some of the comments that we've already heard. 
Um, so while I, I think, you know, while the specifics might vary, I do want to say that broadly speaking, there are similar types of measures that would promote sustainable finance that policymakers and regulators can consider. Um, so there, I would say that they kind of fall into these four buckets. Um, the one is around financial policies and regulations. So giving um, supervisory uh, authorities actual sustainability and climate mandates, um, making sustainability and climate related disclosures mandatory, requiring climate stress testing for financial institutions, all that could fall under the first bucket. The second one is around fiscal policies. And we've heard, um, you know, Bob mentioned, you know, the importance of pricing emissions, but there are other uh, measures here as well around um, green public procurement requirements, and also thinking about, um, you know, the role of subsidies, both you know, in, in terms of supporting sustainable solutions, but also removing fossil fuel subsidies that we know are, you know, in the trillions around the globe. Um, the third bucket is around the actual targeted use of public finance. So, um, and this is important also as we consider development finance institutions and the need to align public finance more broadly with, with Paris Agreement goals. Um, but also then targeting, uh, you know, funding and de-risking um, instruments to sustainable technologies and infrastructure and funding R&D and sustainable solutions. And this is particularly important for developing countries um, to be able to access climate finance to fund those kinds of investments. Um, the last bucket is around uh, supporting markets and information instruments, and we've heard a couple of these things already mentioned, um, you know, having clear sustainability definitions, emissions accounting and target setting standards. Um, all of that is important as well as certification labeling schemes and um, developing the actual standards for disclosure. So given the fact that global mar or that financial markets are global, um, some of these solutions do need some sort of uh, common alignment uh, across the board. And I think, you know, recognizing that we, we've seen the, I, I think um, Olaf mentioned central banks started thinking more uh, more uh, deliberately about climate change about five years ago. I think even slightly before that, we saw the, the launch of the task force for financial uh, climate related disclosures. Um, you know, I think that kind of speaks to the broader need to align uh, things like disclosures across the board. So while we can't have a one size fits all solution, I think there is a need to kind of come together and collaborate and even um, the NGFS, the network for greening the financial system, I think is another kind of clear point of evidence around the need to come up with some sort of global harmonization around the approach. I'll stop there. Thank you, very clear. Um, by mentioning uh, carbon pricing, disclosure, regulation, um, it all seems almost like a, a technical or, or a, a political issue. I, I would like to, to pick up from uh, a question that was posed in the chat by Karin Luzada. Um, she says, climate change disproportionately impacts communities of color, minorities, and now the question is, is gone, um, but she, so I'll, I'll do it by heart. Mm -hmm. um, oh, it's, it's moved to another tab, I see. It is um, affecting, let's say, uh, uh, minorities uh, differently than, than perhaps companies. Um, can you say a little bit about the social aspect of, of this transition and, and um, to what extent the financial sector is actually uh, taking this into account? Isn't that a role of the financial sector? Yeah, yeah. No, it's, I, I think I saw that question in the chat. Um, I think one one issue that we see a lot in our work is climate change is often just considered more of an environmental issue, and and it's not. It's it's an environmental and social issue. This is going to affect humanity. Um, I think first and foremost, and then you know the the environment that that we live in as well. So there there is that you know close um, interconnection, um, and I, I think part of the question was also around. Um, you know, with a greater attention on physical risks, like what, how, how could that disproportionately affect communities? Um, if, uh, if investors and companies suddenly realize, oh, we're, 
we're exposed to these impacts associated with climate change. So we're just going to pick up and move. And with that, you know, we'll take jobs and, and um, you know, house values will, will fall. All of these um, kind of impacts can play out. Uh, so we think uh, we, we actually have a fair amount of research in our team that focuses on physical risk from climate change and, and actually helping investors and companies better understand them. Because um, while there's been a lot of attention on the issues, uh, we actually found that there are considerable gaps in kind of the range of hazards that are even mentioned by climate related um, disclosure guidance. So uh, they, they don't necessarily discuss the full range of climate impacts that scientists are warning about, let alone um, providing a clear framework for consistently considering those risks. Um, so that is a focus of our research, but I think the additional step after that is how do you help companies that, and investors not just respond with a kind of more of a capital flight mentality, but what are some of the measures they need to take to build resilience? Um, and, and, you know, in cases where the options are very limited. How do they work with communities to mitigate the, the impacts on those communities as, as things transition? Um, so it's it's something I think, I, I think looking at the Biden administration, for instance, there is more recognition around the intersection of climate and unvulnerable populations um, in our country and also elsewhere. So hopefully we'll see some, some more thoughtful approaches going forward. Thank you. And then I would almost say, uh, hold that thought, because this is an issue that I would like to, uh, to get back to later as well. Um, if, if we think of insurance companies, they are often seen as uh, the first ones to actually see what's happening in the markets because they, they try to price and, and often hedge risks. Um, but it's not that if they have solved that risk in, in their portfolio that their clients um, do actually uh, get away with it. It's often the price goes up for the premium. Uh, so there is a broader social discussion to be had here. But before we get there, I think I should go to the, uh, the fourth panelist uh, on our panel. And that is Anna Carolina Oliveira. Um, Anna is a banker. She works for ING, the Dutch uh, bank, and she is head of sustainable finance. Um, and maybe to you, Anna Carolina, the, the same question that I started off with, uh, with uh, Olaf Sleipen. Um, you have a function title of Head of Sustainable Finance. I would almost ask you as well, is there any other type of finance? Good question. Uh, thank you, Marcel and Holland and Dehu for having me here today. It's really, truly a privilege to be part of this discussion. So yeah, so maybe what I do, what I do as sustainable finance, in fact, I'm, I'm responsible for the Americas, but I have colleagues all around the globe in Europe and Asia as well. So what we do, uh, it's really engaging with clients that want to somehow attach uh, some of the initiatives and target setting and, and, and commitments they are making when it comes to sustainability to their capital structure. So it's not to say that all financing shouldn't be sustainable. I think I'm with you there. It's more when you have this uh, structurally changing, the, 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 the debt being a loan, a bond, the derivative, whatever it is, due to a sustainability performance. And that's what we call sustainable finance. But uh, to your point, it's much broader than that. Uh, I think uh, all, all banks, uh, public or private, have a huge role to play in this discussion. In one hand, we should continue financing what's considered the pure place, the renewable energy providers, and all the green activities that are extremely important to allow everybody to reach that their net zero targets. You, have, you, you definitely need a lot of renewable power for one. Uh, but doing that alone is not sufficient. You really have to look at the transition and how you can support the sectors that are more in the carbon intensive and still some of their products are extremely necessary and there are no substitutes today for things like cement, aluminum, and you name it. So you have really to, to, to be very democratic in a way to bring all the, the sectors along and, and trying to find solution. And there, of course, the challenges are 
are, are large, but also uh, I'm very hopeful and optimistic that we're we're moving the, the right direction. So as a bank, we approach from this two angles. So one at the portfolio level, we work with those more carbon intensive sectors and with uh, industry experts to define some of the, the topics were mentioned today, how to set a target. Uh, we like to say at ING, there are many roads to Paris. Uh, so uh, um, these decarbonization goals or a direction of travels mean different things for different industries. So we try to to set targets at the industry level and help those companies to get there and help meaning uh, not only advising them uh, how they should adopt some of those targets in their debt structures, but also hopefully financing also the technology shift that's many times required to allow them to make that uh, jump, if you will. And uh, maybe on a more micro level, what we do may maybe my more day to day is when we talk to companies and for me, especially in the US and the Americas, is to help them to, to, to identify which are the topics that are very material for their respective business. There are many starting points that we don't like to say there's no right or wrong one. Everybody's a journey. You just need to be very mindful to pick the right topics for your sector. So making sure you select things that are material to your industry and you set some level of ambition. Again, that will be, it will be different uh, per, per each company, but there are many ways to, to try to make sure there's teeth into, into the structure by, for example, looking at Ex external benchmarks, uh, using things like science-based methodologies to validate your targets, et cetera. So all in all, it's it's a, a big challenge, but we are on the camp that um, sustainability is better business. So it's not a choice between uh, profitability or sustainability. Actually, two things go hand in hand. Did Olaf Sleipen uh, referred in his introductory remarks to uh, the shareholder meeting of the, uh, the international oil company Shell that is taking place these days and um, in, in the Dutch news, I don't know whether that's on your side of the pond as well, but it's um, several uh, pension funds actually announced that they would uh, refrain from investing in, in Shell and uh, some of them pushed by their own clients. Um, if I understand you correctly, um, uh, you would not choose to step out, but rather engage with such a company um, to, to kind of steer the uh, course of the company into a greener direction. Is that, is that a correct assumption from what you just said? That's right. That's exactly right, Marcel. We, we take the view we, we probably provide more value add if we are in the conversation, if we engage with these companies and try to steer them towards where we believe is, is the right direction. Of course, there are things you bear in mind for an environment and social risk standpoint. So actually a bit of my background, that's how I started in this world, was as environment and social risk analyst myself. At the, those days, there were no such a thing as a green bond yet or sustainable finance. It was much more uh, making sure you're preventing the risks. So that's still a concern. And, and for example, at IMG, we do have our policies and, and some activities, so for example, parts of the, the coal industry, there are some things basically won't be viable anymore. And for those, uh, we have to make a decision and say, okay, we won't engage anymore because there are already technology and alternatives available that are cleaner, therefore we disengage. But for 99% of the cases, we indeed engage. And I think there, uh, the conversation is how to, help the, the, the steering or the shifting of those activities from more carbon intensive to less. It, it's controversial. Uh, a lot of uh, views are that you should be stopping financing uh, period, uh, but the IA was also releasing their most updated report and, and it's a journey. So you have to make a plan. There are incremental steps. And actually this week we were in the market uh, supporting a company in Central Eastern Europe, which is a utility in the oil and gas sector which is want to issue a green bond because all the money they're raising is to support projects in renewable energy. So to actually provide them the funding to move away from them fossil fuel storage, renewable power. So we do think that's that's a more um, progressive way and more pragmatic and uh, we, we hope to, to continue engaging with the, all the sectors. Thank you. And, and maybe this is a, um, a good segue to one of the other questions that uh, came up in the, in the chat. Um, see the first question that came in, um, by exclusively focusing on sustainable finance and not juxtaposing it with traditional fossil fuel finance, 
um, are we not trying to reputationally, in terms of good corporate citizenship, have our cake and eat it? So, so the, 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 the element of reputation is, is uh, coming in here. And maybe also the, um, the different weight or a different size that sustainable finance has as opposed to fossil fuel finance. Maybe not necessarily a question to you, but I, I encourage the others to uh, to come in here as well. Who wants to, to give this a try? Maybe I can. Julia, please go ahead. Uh, I'll start with just a, a brief comment on this. I think um, when when we think of sustainable finance, we're we're thinking of the financial system, so not the the special carve out that's focused just on the good thing, but really how do we align the financial system with sustainability goals? So I think in that in that regard, um, you know, it is talking about. I, I think the focus is really on this transformational shift of the financial system. Um, in, in that context, though, I think it's really helpful to put the spotlight on, on the unsustainable finance. And, and we know very clearly the fossil fuel finance is, is unsustainable. It does need, we do need companies to transition very quickly. Um, and so that can be a really good proxy. It's not the, that is certainly not even the only area of unsustainable investments. There are other kinds of unsustainable investments, but it can be a good indicator of the scale of the challenge and just how much we do need um, companies to transition and how we need financial flows to um, shift in a different direction. I'll stop there because I'm sure others have more to add on it. And, and, and the issue of, of it, it was called reputation in the question, but perhaps there's an element of greenwashing in there as well. Uh, in the, the European Union, there has been some discussion and finally agreement on what is called a taxonomy. Um, and that is, used to actually know what we're talking about. Is something like that going on in the United States or perhaps necessary that we agree on, on a certain terminology or a list of our taxonomy uh, so we actually know what to do and to make the economy more sustainable? I see you uh, nodding, Bob. Please give it a try. Yeah, no, I, I agree. We do have to define terms in the United States. And uh, in the in the uh, subcommittee, we talked about this and we all agreed, you know, we can't have a situation where funds say that they are an ESG fund or uh, someone issues a green bond and these terms are not well defined right now. So the Europeans are definitely ahead of us. But having said that, there is in this country a little bit of a negative connotation associated with the word taxonomy, you know, because in the European context, it has this implication that there are going to be green companies and brown companies or green activities and brown activities, and that uh, somehow the financial system is going to put a higher cost of capital on those brown activities and that somehow that's going to uh, cause the economy to turn in the direction of of green, and uh, you know there's there's good reasons to think that that won't be successful because there is plenty of investors who, if they see an above risk adjusted rate of return, they're going to get involved there. So maybe banks will pull back, but someone else will come in, and so uh, at the end of the day, we just have to be realistic and understand that the financial system, and frankly, the financial regulators cannot create the incentives that we need for the private sector to reduce emissions. That has to come from the government. And we all see that, you know, the, the participants in the financial sector are unanimous in this. We want government to create those incentives. Even the oil companies want governments to create those incentives. But as long as those incentives are not there, and Europe is ahead of us, they have those incentives, let's be very clear. And they're moving toward a less uh, carbon intensive economy as we all should, but the United States is not there. Our you know, uh, tax system does not create those incentives. And so companies you know, in the pursuit of profits, given that the incentives that they have cause capital to flow into the existing high carbon economy. And that's just you know, not something that the financial regulators or, or public disclosure or corporations uh, on their own can affect. It has to be done by government. Frankly, in this country, it's focused right now on the US Senate and the fact that we need Republicans to recognize reality. <laughs> it's kind of the one class of, 
of participants in the financial system that don't seem to get it quite yet. One um, objective of, of this seminar is also to see where we can uh, cooperate between the Netherlands and the USA or Europe and the USA. You say taxonomy is perhaps a little bit of a controversial term. Um, are there any ways that we from our side can help you with actually advancing this thinking or maybe taking over some of those examples in, in the US or should we just take a step back and, and let you develop your own taxonomy? What, what would be uh, wise to do here? Well, I, Europe is definitely ahead of us. And again, uh, everyone in the US financial system understands that. So we're looking to Europeans for uh, direction. Uh, you know, the US Fed has joined the NGFS. We're getting involved in things like IOSCO and, and the Basel, uh, you know, initiatives. And so I think we are coming to a globally harmonized approach and, and that will take some time. Uh, I don't think the Europeans have to do much other than continue to move in the direction that they have, which is terrific in providing that leadership. Uh, I do think, and I think the Europeans can expect the U.S. to move much more quickly now uh, going forward. And, and I think once the Europeans and the U.S. are in sync, uh, that the rest of the world will quickly uh, move together. And so, again, I would say uh, everyone seems to be talking about getting to net zero by 2050 or earlier. And I think most uh, of the participants are well aware of the fact that that's going to require uh, strong incentives for the private sector to reduce emissions. So I, I think we're uh, pretty much aligned. And Anna Carolina, as, as uh, a bank that is big in the, the United States and big in Europe, I'm sure you're demanding from uh, governments on both sides of the Atlantic to actually harmonize or to come up with similar kinds of, of regulations for you. Is, is this a kind of a, a debate that you're involved in that you try to, uh, to push? Yeah, we of course have uh, many parts of the bank uh, trying to share our thoughts uh, with, of course, the, 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 the DMB, the European Central Bank, the EBA and all these initiatives. We, as was said, the opening, uh, spending a lot of time and in, in, in working on climate risk integration and how we can better reflect your point above how to have the cost of externalities better incorporated in your credit decisions. Because to me, that's, that's the way forward when we start speaking about further harmonization and having defined terms, absolutely a step necessary. And the, the, the flip side, or maybe a, a, another way to look at it is how the credit rating agencies are incorporating ESG into their scoring or in the, their assessments. They, they already do this for a while, but now it's, it's becoming more structurally. And I just read this morning that the S&P has uh, changed the outlook of 39% of the, the outlook changes they performed last year was due to some sort of ESG related um, factor. So to me, that's really the way forward that once those things are further you know, harmonized and part of the same score, if you will, or the same assessment, that's when you have that reflected really into the cost of capital and how banks are pricing transactions. So still a, lot, a long way to go. Uh, and that's for us when you are, of course, international, operating internationally, it's, it's a quite a unified way to, you know, everybody looks at the credit rating, right, regardless of the location and, and things, initiatives like that help also for the corporations, right? If you have business here and in the EU, it helps them also to be aligning their disclosure policies and their reporting with the more international standards. The, the, over to, uh, to Olaf. Uh, Olaf, the, this, this panel is also um, used to see what we can learn from each other. I, I, of course, I know one example from the Netherlands, uh, and that is the Platform for Sustainable Finance in which the, the financial sector, um, bankers, insurance companies, pension funds, and of course, chaired by you, by yourself, uh, Olaf, um, is talking about potential solutions and, and, and uh, on, on sustainable finance. Perhaps also for our American audience, can you explain a little bit what, what you're doing in that platform and how it came about and, and actually what maybe a few examples of, um, of the outcome of the platform? Yes, gladly. Um, 
we um, we as central bank we kind of initiated the platform a couple of years ago. Um, we are chairing it. We are providing the secretariat, but basically, the the, the financial institutions or or representative organizations of financial institutions who are doing most of the work and also decide on what they want to work on. The reason why we initiated the platform actually already quite a lot going on, uh, but it was rather sectoral. So uh, uh, there were banks thinking about, you know, um, sustainability, there were pension funds, insurance companies, and, and the interact, um, let's say sectors, at least in the Netherlands, was, um, let's say, not always optimal. So we thought, bring, why not bring this knowledge uh, together? and make uh, really a group of, of people and a lot of subgroups and committees and working on several issues together across the whole financial sector. Um, and one of the things actually uh, the, 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 the platform did, and actually it was something, again, that the, the institutions came up with themselves, is we always, there was always a lot of criticism um, towards regulators because saying, yeah, we want to do something in the area of, sustainability you know we want to uh, we are absolutely in favor of it but regulation does not allow us to do so and um so actually we asked uh, okay if that is so please let us know what are the hurdles what are the obstacles so um they started to work on a report and the report is also actually published i uh, I'm, I'm not sure whether it's available in english but uh, you can find it on on, on the website or website of the platform and maybe maybe there is an English version of it and otherwise I'm, I'm more than happy if people want to to know a little bit more about it to provide at least a, an English a summary of the report but the conclusion was actually uh, we looked at it and actually there are no hurdles um, and at least no substantial hurdles and to the extent that there are hurdles uh, it has more to do with uh, uh, how do that financial uh, frameworks evaluate or price risks, so to speak, it's the kind of discussion we talked about before, but essentially there are no hurdles. So I think that's one of the interesting products uh, um, the platform came with. Um, maybe maybe where, uh, one other thing, what I heard about this discussion just now, maybe where potentially the US might have a competitive edge in mobilizing capital. I totally agree. I also said it in my remarks with, with Bob Litterman when he said, you know, in, I mean, the financial sector can do a lot, but in the end, it's the government that, that, that really has to start, uh, uh, or government policy that has to make uh, things happening and going in the right direction, is that capital markets in the US are in a way much more uh, developed and particular also so venture capital markets, and this is very, very important for uh, startups, uh, new technologies. Um, I mean, uh, as as uh, as uh, uh, you know, Marcel, but others maybe know it as well. We are working on a project, what we call Capital Markets Union in in, in the European Union. But uh, this is still a challenge. Eh? Our our the financial system Europe is very much bank-based uh, and the venture capital market is relatively small. It's much bigger in the US. And there I think is it, it, there's, a, there's, a, there's a huge possibility or, or there are a lot of possibilities. And indeed, if, if you create the right incentives by the right, uh, the right um, uh, by pricing CO2, but also by giving indeed, by presenting a firm view or where do we want to stand, let's say in a couple of years from now, um, I think then, then uh, things go in the right direction. And indeed, as it was already said by my colleagues, um, it, and from that point of view, sustainable finance is a little bit misleading. This is a little bit how it started. It is finance. It is market economy. It's not, not a niche. It's nothing else. So it's, it's, it is exactly the system we are used to. Uh, but um, uh, we need the appropriate uh, incentives and, and, and triggers. And we do not need them because, uh, because political reasons or whatever, but purely for economic reasons, because we have to, let's say, move the economy in a different direct direction. If we don't, we are really heading uh, into, into difficulties. 
Thank you, uh, thank you for that, and and also thank you for sharing the example of the uh, of the platform and and one of their products. Uh, I actually would like to ask one of the colleagues to post a link in the chat uh, to uh, at least a summary of that report. I think that could be useful. Um, this this is of course about the interaction and the cooperation between the public and the private sector and the regulator, um, much voluntary based. Um, Maybe that this as a question to you, Julia. Do you see such a, a voluntary cooperation between the public and the private sector, the financial sector and the government uh, happening in the United States? Also against the backdrop of what Bob said in the beginning, we need strict regulation. We need political action. Is, is that the right context to sit around the table and discuss options or do we need something else in the United States? I think in the US, we, we need kind of, uh, kind of all the tools in the toolbox at this stage. So um, we need to have very candid conversations, um, bringing the private sector and um, legislators and regulators together to talk about um, their their needs and priorities um, and have that, that frank conversation. Um, there needs to be inputs. You know, we're, we're seeing right now the, the SEC has, um, asked for comments about, uh, you know, updating the, the climate related disclosures requirement to, to clarify. I mean, there's been a, a regulation on the books since 2010 um, requiring companies to, to um, disclose on climate related risks if they're material. Um, but then there's been all of this uh, debate about, well, when is it material? Um, so we, we need that, uh, we need different perspectives, um, but, I, again, I think it's, it's the private sector, it's government, but it's also the scientific community, um, particularly as we're talking about climate change, bringing those those different minds together. Um, and I, I think going back to the representatives' comments at the start, um, there is a lot of action from the private sector, and I think the government can can you know support that in in, in sending like positive signals, um, but also recognizing that there. Are, there are limits to what the private sector will do on its own. Um, so, so having that um, engagement, but willing to step in, I think it's gonna be really important in the, in the US context to, to get us where we need to be. Maybe now you're talking about it, I, I throw in one of the other questions from the chat and the final sentence of that one is, can central bankers fry a chicken out of an omelet? In other words, um, authentic sustainable finance emerge from unsustainable monetary policies is, is, is that not a stretch can you reflect on that one as well uh, Julia that was, I, I saw that that comment I've never heard <laughs> that version of the metaphor um, but I yeah I mean the the there are just there are so many complexities and I, I do think we need some alignment around um, you know we've heard before like really clear incentives and and expectations around policies um, even you know when I when I saw the comment at first I was thinking of the monetary policies like the quantitative easing that we've seen um, from the Federal Reserve in the context of the pandemic just thinking about the the liquidity that was provided in many cases to companies that may not be sustainable five, 10 years from now. Um, and it, how, you know, I think the government does need to think, uh, regulators need to think about um, these issues, particularly around climate change sooner than later. Like we're, we're running out of time, um, particularly knowing that we need to have emissions by 2030. Uh, we, we do need to see better alignment of monetary policies. Thank you. Please, Bob, feel free to add on this one. Well, I think it's important, Marcel, to differentiate between, let me call it, the specific risk that is faced by corporations, which, you know, is very much uh, dependent on where their physical assets are, whether they're on coastlines or in, you know, forests or whatever, uh, and that from transition risk, because uh, I think the transition risk is already to some extent played out. You know, uh, the coal company has, uh, coal 
industry has collapsed over the last 10 years. Oil and gas majors uh, valuations have halved, whereas the uh, rest of the economy has doubled. And, uh, you know, Tesla right now is uh, something like $500 billion of market cap, five times the other auto companies in the U.S. So uh, these valuations have already moved very significantly. And uh, I think the real risk is the physical risk, and it's coming and we have to move now because it's our actions today that are going to impact the maximum temperature and the duration of that heating pulse, you know, 30, 40 years from now. Uh, so those are the risks that are really key. And it's really this uh, intergenerational fairness issue. The CO2 that we put into the atmosphere today is most likely going to have to be pulled out of the atmosphere at some point in the future. And that's a very expensive proposition. So every ton that we put into the atmosphere is a liability that we're leaving for our children, our grandchildren, and it's creating existential risk to the well-being of all future generations. So something where we have to move very fast right now uh, because of that existential threat to the global uh, well-being. Thank you. And, and, and that is um, actually moving from, uh, let's say, a passive approach, knowing what to invest in and what not and avoid risks, as to perhaps a more activist approach in which you try to accelerate the good. And maybe pose that question to you as well, Anna Caroline. I know that that's, uh, ING has developed its own methodology to measure um, impact and to measure its own carbon footprint. Um, has that led within your bank to this more uh, progressive approach that you try to actually influence and, and, and um, push the market toward more sustainability? Exactly. So what we, we try to achieve is, as I mentioned, to by looking at different sectors, the carbon, the more carbon intensive to start with, it's eventually everybody's in transition. If, even if you think a, a renewable power producer can be probably more efficient in a couple of years time. So assuming, putting that in, into a side, but looking where the, the carbon intensity is today, we are focusing on those and defining what would be the reductions in, in the GHG or carbon emissions profile in order to allow those sectors to be aligning with the Paris Agreement. And there are some that are already more ahead of the others, meaning by 2050, they can be net zero, some might be by 2060. So there are some, some variations there, but the intention that, or the role you're trying to, to play is to point them in the right direction and see what's the investment plan that goes with it. Because one thing is to say, I wanna be there. And another one completely different is actually explain what are the levers and what are the steps that need to be taken to Bob's point today. It has to start today. Otherwise, we're probably already late. So we, we try to work on that investment plan. And hopefully, uh, we're a small, relatively small bank in the big uh, universe of things, but we can do our share to find as part of that technology shift or that investment. And we heard before, uh, PPPs are extremely important, especially when it comes to new technology development and putting things like hydrogen at scale, et cetera. And, uh, that's what we, we try to also support then more from the, the financing side. Thank you. And I, I see that Representative Cleaver has already entered the uh, digital room. Uh, welcome, uh, Representative. Uh, I will come to you in a minute. Um, but first, I would like to ask all the panelists also with an, um, an eye on the clock. Um, time flies when you're having fun um, to maybe give us a final reflection on the topic um, and, and perhaps a little offer or question to the others um, from the, the perspective of, of the Netherlands or the European Union towards the USA and the other way around. So for that, I, I start with you, uh, Olaf, uh, final remarks. Yeah, we should continue to and to learn from each other. I think that's extremely important. Um, Bob said Europe is now ahead of the US. It's also known as a very dynamic, flexible environment. Come up where we in the Netherlands or in Europe, in Europe might learn from. Um, indeed, uh, uh, and that's also my, my guess that, that a lot will, will change in the US, let's say, in, 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 in let's say, similar directions. 
And the, the, for Europe, it would be a mistake to say, okay, um, this, um, and this is, uh, the others should adapt. And to be quite open and fri quite frank about you, I see that sometimes already happening in the discussion. Uh, uh, now, um, uh, the, the, the IFRS is also starting to work on, uh, on, uh, on, on, on standards uh, of, let's say, disclosing uh, non-financial information, uh, information related to climate risks, uh, which we think is extremely important because it's a global standard, it's used by, by global companies, and then al already I see some Europeans, Euro some European countries saying, yeah, but we have our own. Uh, and I think this is the risk that I see, uh, uh, that, we, that we become too, uh, let's say, uh, self-confident in Europe about what, that we, what we have is actually the right system. We might be ahead now, but in a couple of years, we might no longer be ahead. So I think we should continue indeed having this dialogue because I am sure that there's also a time where, where we really can learn, uh, let's say, uh, of the experiences in the US. That's a, that's a good segue to Bob, um, an overconfident Europe towards, towards a very humble United States. Is that how it works these days, uh, Bob? Maybe a few final reflections from your side? Well, I think the U.S. should be very humble these days, but uh, at the same time, there's a lot of very exciting opportunities here going on, uh, particularly in venture and clean tech. Uh, there's just so many companies with great ideas now. Uh, some of their valuations are a little crazy, uh, expensive, but uh, uh, I think there's, you know, investors in this country are seeing how rapidly things can change. A, a lot of capital is now flowing in the right direction. Uh, not enough, uh, and we have to accelerate that. But uh, but I agree, it's going to be a very competitive world going forward, and uh, hopefully the U.S. is going to catch up and uh, and do what it should be doing uh, very quickly. Thank you, Julia. A few reflections from your side. Thank you. Yeah. So I one thing that I'm thinking about too is is COP26. We haven't talked about that, but um, there's the next uh, conference of the parties under the UN UNFCCC taking place in UK in November, and there is just. Uh, this incredible momentum that we are seeing from the financial community. Um, during the leader summit, we saw a slew of announcements um, during and before that around net zero commitment. So I think it's really more of a, a watch this space in the, in the coming months uh, to see what kinds of actions um, financial actors come forward with themselves, but also this opportunity for collaboration between the EU, um, between the UK, between the US and, and you know, countries across across the globe to push uh, for greater ambition on um, alignment of all financial flows with the Paris Agreement. So um, looking forward to seeing more ambition um, in the coming months. Thanks. Thank you for bringing that up um, and, and quoting Article 2.1c of the Paris Agreement. I think that is our common task here. So uh, uh, that's, that's great that you have mentioned that. Um, Anna Carolina, final thoughts? Yeah, maybe repeating a bit what was said, I think further collaboration, there's never too much co collaboration, cooperation, I think my, my two cents would be to, to be transparent, I think everybody is striving to achieve a similar goal and we are of the view, all these efforts we make in setting targets and steering portfolio, we make those all open source and we invite all the banks, the peers, and society look at them, provide feedback, and it's it's not it's one planet, right? So it's 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 not about a competition; it's about uh, being a, a collective effort. So more collaboration and transparency would be my my clue. Thank you, and and then this is the moment to uh, to officially welcome Representative Emmanuel Cleaver, um, serving his ninth term already representing Missouri's 5th Congressional District and, as I read in his bio, the home district of President Harry Truman. So this should be the, the very good uh, stepping stone towards an even greater future. Um, Representative Cleaver is a member of the House Committee on Financial Services, so the committee that I think is relevant for the discussion that we, uh, we just had. Uh, 
Representative Cleaver, over to you for uh, final remarks from your side uh, at this Holland on the Hill seminar. Well, you're very nice to, to uh, invite me to speak to you, uh, particularly at a time when the United States has fallen about four years behind in, uh, in dealing with uh, the issues of, of climate. And uh, I think that uh, dealing with the environment is the most serious uh, issue facing the world's uh, political leaders at this time. Uh, and it, it is uh, something that uh, embarrassingly, I must admit, we, we have not uh, provided much uh, leadership for the world uh, in the uh, recent days uh, gone by. Uh, however, uh, we are gradually uh, entering the, the 21st century uh, in terms of the uh, environment. And I think you'll note that uh, the, the administration has placed uh, significant dollars in the, uh, in the, the, the new uh, package uh, for infrastructure that is being debated. Uh, actually, the, there's a meeting going at the White House at, right at, at this very moment. Uh, and we're talking about putting charging stations all over the United States and uh, helping the automobile industry uh, move toward uh, uh, electric uh, automobiles. And I think uh, for, for my own uh, congressional district, uh, we, we just uh, put in a request uh, for the, the um, purchase of uh, six new uh, electric buses uh, for our city uh, bus system. So uh, I, 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 I apologize for, for my, my country's uh, recent backward uh, attitude about uh, climate change. Uh, and when, when we think about climate change, um, many of us tend to think in terms of uh, environment only, you know, the, the, the trees and the flowers and uh, the food and so forth. Uh, however, um, I think as demonstrated by your discussion, uh, we're beginning to realize that that discussion has to be expanded. Uh, and uh, we have to, if we really want to understand the needs we have for uh, fighting climate change, we've got to include national security. We've got to in uh, include uh, economic risk as well as fiscal, fiscal responsibility. Uh, I was fortunate to chair the uh, Financial Services Subcommittee on National Security and now the Subcommittee on Housing and Insurance. And uh, we've been trying to highlight through hearings uh, and legislation in the, in the recent years that uh, ec the, the economic impact of climate change is Herculean. Uh, and uh, according to recent research from the National Bureau of Economic Research, the effects of climate change may cause a 10.5% loss in uh, US GDP uh, by uh, the year 2100. Uh, now to put that in some kind of contemporary uh, perspective, uh, I, I think it would be uh, important to note that, that some uh, economic sectors are projected to suffer annual economic losses in the hundreds of billions of dollars by the end of the century. Uh, and uh, it, it, is, it is an environmental issue, but it, I think we would be very, very smart to realize that it is an economic issue. If you just think about this, uh, during this uh, uh, COVID-19 crisis, the U.S. economy uh, actually shrank at U.S. GDP by 3.5%. And as I mentioned earlier, if we keep going at the rate we're going without addressing this problem, it could we could have a 10.5 uh, GDP loss in the U.S. economy by uh, uh, the, the uh, year 2100. Uh, and so, uh, you know, some economic sources, uh, you know, are projected to suffer annual losses uh, that that are going to, going to be you know so significant that. Uh, we, we could be really put on the very edge of, of a, uh, a recession or depression, uh, the, the likes of which we've not seen. And seven of the, the, the top 10 economic risks identified in the world 
Economic Forum's 2019 risk report are released, uh, are related to or caused by climate change. Now, these are glaring, flashing points. Uh, this is, uh, you know, a, a, an alarm going off, a warning uh, that we need to, uh, to uh, put in place a course correction right now uh, or economic uh, calamity is down the road, inevitably. Uh, we can, die, you know, the people in our country uh, can deny climate change all day and all night, uh, but it's not going to chop, stop it because they, they have, they're denying it. And um, I'm having some, uh, some uh, I think, problems again. Uh, okay. Um, I apologize that in about 15 years, I'm going to have this zoom down. Uh, and uh, so we can't, we can't move to anything else <laughs> over the next 15 years. Uh, last uh, Congress, as chair of the financial uh, subcommittee on national security, I convened a, a hearing on the macroeconomic risk uh, posed by a rapidly changing climate, uh, where uh, we heard from renowned climate scientists and leading e economists. And following that uh, hearing, I introduced my climate finance bill called the Respond Act. Uh, climate finance is a massive multifaceted issue, but one posed to public sector pension programs and working class Americans uh, retirement portfolios. Uh, in 2018, the state of New York authorized a study that showed investments in the fossil fuel sector lost the New York State Common Retirement Fund approximately $22 billion in estimated profits across the last 10 years. Uh, with more than 6 million participants and $770 billion in investments, the U.S. federal pension program is the largest on the planet. Consequently, I, I quickly became uh, concerned about the, the risk and future losses these six million federal employees were facing and began to do work on what has now become the Respond Act. Uh, the Respond Act, if I can run over just a, 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 a little bit and then uh, close out. Uh, the, the commission, the Federal Pension Board uh, would establish would be a federal advisory panel on, economic, on the economics of climate change, which would conduct a thorough examination of the financial risk posed by climate change to federal employee retirement benefits and report those uh, findings to, to Congress. And uh, if the panel's report finds that this, uh, that this investment from fossil fuel holdings would continue to support profitable pension yields while better insulating them from climate related risk and losses, which every single economist and climate scientist we've spoken with has maintained then the board would be required to set a plan in place to transition their investment practices uh, accordingly. Now, my uh, Senate partner uh, is uh, Jeff Merkley, and he and I have put in a lot of uh, hard work to address this issue before it becomes a pension crisis down the road, which is what I meant by needing to look at climate change as a fiscal responsibility uh, as well. <clears throat> Let me uh, close out by uh, having talked about the financial risk and no one would probably even think to look at, at the issues of, of the pension. But if we, uh, if, if climate change continues to be an untamed part of our lifestyle, our children and frankly, their children and their children's children will have to contend with something called extinction. And I don't think that that's an exaggeration. Uh, look, you, you can you can take uh, insects off the off of the planet, and the planet uh, would probably collapse. Uh, you can take us off the planet, and the the planet becomes healthy. Uh, uh, and and so it, it comes clear to me, at least, that uh, the, the 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 human life, the 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 the, the uh, part of the Earth uh, uh, where humans uh, that humans occupy is the part of the earth that's being done uh, the, the most damage to. And, uh, and, and, we're the, and we're the least necessary 
uh, organism on the earth uh, for its existence. So uh, look, I'm glad to be a human. I'm glad I'm not a bumblebee. But the truth of the matter is humans have been messing up the planet. And this is the only one we have. And I thank God for those of you who are committing a great portion of your life trying to turn it around. Thank you for, for uh, in, indulging me for this few minutes. Thank you, uh, Representative Cleaver, for these uh, inspiring, but perhaps also sobering words. Um, you connected the dots perfectly, including basically all main threats of, of the discussion we just had on the, the breadth and width of the, um, uh, of, of the financial sector and the financial responsibility, the role of politics and governments, but also of the uh, financial sector and the private sector itself the long-term versus the short-term and the, the, the Herculean task, as you called it, that we, uh, that we face. Um, I won't go over the whole discussion again. I think it's, um, uh, you wrapped it up very nicely. And um, I think with that, also looking at the clock, we promised to, uh, to stop at six o'clock European time. That is uh, about 12 o'clock your time. So it's lunchtime in, uh, in Washington, D.C., um, thank you all for joining. Thanks for the audience to, uh, to stay with us. I'm sure this recording will be uh, available on the internet. Um, this was a, a good webinar, a good um, digital version of Holland on the Hill. I hope a next time we will be able to, uh, to see each other uh, in person again. But for now, this worked well. And thank you for highlighting what you're doing in this field and on this Herculean task. And I hope to uh, speaking with one of you that indeed we can keep on learning from each other and uh, cooperate in the right direction. So thank you all. And I hope to see you next time. <laughs>